Gratitude destroys the two emotions that wipe out most people's quality of life, fear and anger. Think about it. What messes up your relationship? What messes up your body? What messes up your business? Fear anger. and anger. So sure. if you're in a situation where you're grateful, you can't be grateful and angry simultaneously. It's gone. And instead of being grateful for some phony thing, you're remembering a real moment and you're reliving it in your body. So it activates your nervous system, not just your mind. Mm -hmm. And that's a big difference. Welcome back to the show, everybody. I'm so excited about today. Um, you know, I was thinking about introducing him. I, you know, there's really not a lot of words to introduce this man. I, I was thinking about it, driving out here for the interview today. I, I've been on the earth 50 years, and I believe this one human being that I'm going to introduce to you in a minute has positively affected and changed more people's lives in those 50 years than any other human being on the spinning earth. And that's a pretty big <laughs> statement to make. I believe he's affected more lives than any other human being in the last 50 years that I've been alive. And one thing he, all the guests on my show have in common We've all been influenced by this man ourselves, and he's an icon, and I'm proud to call him a friend of mine, too. So, Tony Robbins, welcome to the show again, brother. Thank you, Ed, for that introduction. <laughs> waiting for Jesus to walk out here. So. <laughs> I don't I'm know, not going to go that about, far, because I, I know you're be better little, than that. might be a little hyperbole there about me being the most powerful and influential, but I am really grateful to you, Ed, because uh, you and I, we both are driven to find answers, right, in the middle yeah. of people's uncertainties and fears. It's one of the things I respect about you, and I love seeing how much your podcast has grown. Congratulations. Thank you, brother. Thank you. And speaking of that, I want to go right to it. If I'm going to get you on the show, I want to really help as many people, and I know and serve as many people as you do. And you've gone right to it. We're in this time where there's so much uncertainty externally yeah. in people's lives. You know, what's happening on with the pandemic? Masks, no masks, all the political discourse, all this stuff, this noise, this uncertainty. Yeah. And I think there's so much angst and anxiety in our culture right now. So many people listening to this or watching it right now. What would you say to them that are experiencing those emotions right now? What advice would you give them? Uh, they got to turn off the news. I know that sounds overly simplistic, but you got to at least mm -hmm. turn it off a little bit mm -hmm. so you can get a breath. Because unfortunately today, it's hard to turn it off since it follows you. I yeah. mean, most people have seen the social dilemma. They understand that literally you are being tracked in every single thing you speak, say, do, and everything you're going to see. And it's different if you type in global warming and you're one person, you're going to completely different set of answers than if you type in global person warming and you're another person. So we're living in a world where it's hard to find truth. And so the first place you got to realize is you can't control out the outside world. You can influence it. Mm. But we can control the inside world. And if you get yourself overwhelmed, it's because all this is coming at you. You got to slow it down, stop it, and say, now, what am I going to create out of this insanity? Because mm. that's the great thing that happens. And I know it sounds, you know, optimistic or, mm. and I think you know mm. me well enough. I'm not one of those positive right. thinkers. I've never been. I believe in intelligence. I believe in seeing things as they are, but not worse than it is. Mm -hmm. So you don't try. Mm -hmm. But then you got to see it better than it is, or you can't make it better. And then you got to go to work and get the right strategies to make it happen. Yeah. So for me, it's really slow it down. And everyone needs a compelling future. Mm -hmm. What do I mean by that? Anybody can deal with a tough today if they have a compelling tomorrow. Mm -hmm. But what's happened is there are a large number of people that after the first run of 2020, yeah. we were coming into January. And I remember that and people are like, all right, now it's a new world. It's a new life. It's going to, it's going to go great. And then, you know, all of a sudden more people died in 2021 with, with vaccines and with all these details that we have. And so people are uncertain. And now we got Omicron and people are making it like the great plague. When if you actually look at the science, the vast majority are showing it's more like a cold or a really gentle flu. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't matter. We're tracking everything now. If you imagine if we were tracking the flu constantly right. and where right. it was, we just we don't test everybody so we don't freak out all the time. Yeah. So what are you going to do to create a compelling future for yourself? Mm -hmm. What do you really want this year to be about, regardless of what's going on in the outside world? You might say, well, Tony, that's easy to say, but they're controlling my business or they're shutting me down here. You can move. You know, you can make new choices. I know they're not easy ones, mm. but you got to get to the point where you say, I won't settle for less than I can really do, be, share, create, and give in my life for my family, for myself, for what, mm. I, what I want for my life. There's a point we got to say enough is enough, mm. and you got to start to take control. How do you do that? One of the things that you say that I love is fear is physical. And yes, what is. I learned from you so many years ago that transformed my life is to begin to learn to change my state with my physiology. Yes. Everything in my life starts with my physiology from my fitness, yeah. but also when I'm feeling something I don't want to feel, I try to shift my physiology. And I just heard you recently say this. So I'd like you to speak to it, that sure. fear is also a physical thing. I want you to elaborate a little bit about that. Well, first of all, if you're concerned about COVID, according to the CDC, and I have this in my new book, the number one you know, issue besides age, obviously, the number one piece is being overweight. 
right? Or obese. That is number one. And just this week, CNN, New York Times, for the first time, two years later, are coming and saying, you can reduce your risk if you take care of your body, right? But yeah. Do you know what number two is, according to the CDC? Fear. Because wow. when you get fearful, it changes your breathing, your body temperature, your tension in your body. Mm. All these things can create a trigger of reactions, hormones in your body that make you crazy. So mm. when I say fear is physical, here's what I mean. You, uh, fear is physical, by the way, so is courage. Emotions yeah. are physical. If you're mm. really scared, if you've ever been at that point where you're like freaked out about something and you can't quite fully swallow or you got that Certainly. feeling in your gut, Certainly. But courage is also physical. That's what you're talking about. Like, it's like I trained myself from a very young age that the number one thing I had to do so I would follow through on the things we're talking about here is I had to have a mind and body that were strong together. That every day I was going to do something to strengthen my body, even if it was just 10 minutes or 15 minutes, something was going to shift me physiologically to do that. And so I, you know, I get scared or I get frustrated and I go on a run, I go on a sprint and I wasn't in shape, didn't matter. I pushed myself beyond where I was comfortable with. I go lift weights and I pushed beyond where I was comfortable with. And when you do that, everything in your nervous system changes. Because mm. all of a sudden, when you face something and you push beyond the comfort zone, you get stronger and stronger. Even a little bit each day changes things. Mm. So think about it, courage, that's not, you're not afraid. Because there'd be no need for courage. Mm. Courage is you're scared shitless, but you do it anyway. Yeah. And so training your body, and you and I both do this, right? We train intensely yep. because we know this is the resource through which my mind's going to try to make decisions. And then the second thing is every day you got to feed your brain, your mind, because if you don't, crap is going in there automatically. We all know that, right? Yeah. I mean, today it's chasing you because we all know the news knows they're not bad people. They're good people. They're just doing their job. Their job is make sure they make as much money for their shareholders right. and they know one formula works and it's pretty obvious these last two years more than ever if it bleeds it leads mm -hmm. if it produces fear more people watch it's because we all have a two million year old brain that's mm -hmm. always looking for what's wrong what can hurt us mm -hmm. but you know two million year old brain's not going to make you happy right yeah. you have to take control of that two million year old brain and start to direct consciously what you want your life to be so yeah. changing your body radically by a workout, by a run, by a push, by whatever you're going to do, shifting by feeding your brain every single day, and then making sure every day you're taking some form of action towards a compelling future. Like, what am I going to make better? If you have nothing to look forward to, you're going to be pissed off, you're going to be frustrated, you're going to be depressed, you're going to be overwhelmed. And in those emotional states, even though you're a smart person, and you know lots of things, you won't use anything you know. Mm. So to me, the leverage to changing somebody's life is always starting with the human body. If I started to speak to you and I spoke more at uh, this <laughs> tempo and I said, yeah, Ed, I really think people should get their act together and make this their best year ever. Right? <laughs> I feel terrible in my body. Now, I'm not saying everybody needs to talk fast or loud like me. That's my own physiology, but it's kind of trained. But everyone has different gears. <laughs> and when you're low gears, like you can be in a great relationship somebody you totally love and you're both in a great physical state emotional state everything's great you both get a little love from taking the kids to 20 soccer practices and cash flow problems in the business and yeah. all that stuff and all of a sudden same love it doesn't feel like the same love you still love each other but it doesn't come across mm -hmm. and if you're both stressed out then it creates problems in the relationship so the most important factor in your life is the ability to manage your mental emotional state mm -hmm. is the one thing you have complete control of once you learn how Mm -hmm. Then it becomes just the daily discipline. And after and it's not even discipline, it just becomes habit mm -hmm. to say, I'm not going to live in this lousy pace. I'm not going to put up with it. I know what to do. Let me do it. Let me move forward. Mm -hmm. But that's why, you know, I do programs and events where I immerse people. Yeah. Because, you know, you and I can talk about this human it's kind of nod your head. But if I put you in an experience, correct. I always tell people a, a belief is a poor substitute for an experience you can yeah. have a belief about china i take you to china you're going to have an experience it's That's very true. different so, true. And so i think human beings need to put themselves more in experiences there a lot of us today especially with covid being stuck at home and doing business from home a lot of people are stuck in their head yeah. and i tell you get in your head you're dead you're just going circles get in your head you got to get that body and that energy moving and then your head will start to work as well okay so you've all been listening now for say 10 minutes there's two things already number one do you have this compelling future? If someone asked you right now, what's that vision for your future? Second thing is, what are you doing in your body to create a change, to anchor things, to change your state? The third thing was Tony talked about his events. And I just, I want to get this out on the table right away. One of the most incredible things is you've done events for literally millions of people from every continent, every country on the planet. 
And I mean what I said. I'm not saying that because we're friends. I, don't, I, I just I think you've positively affected more lives than any person that I'm aware of. It's, it's just true. And I the fact that you now are offering a free event. It's just bananas to me. I mean, it's it's incredible to me. So I think it starts on January 25th, but I want people to know about this because yeah. this could be that catalyst to help, comp you know, create that compelling future and maybe transcend your environment. So tell us just a little bit about that event. I'll tell you why I did it. I did it, the, you know, after 2020, about halfway through the year, people were just so depressed. You saw people gaining weight. People had no clear idea what they're going to do. So I said, okay, I'm going to do an event for the whole world. <laughs> let's just, let's use YouTube. Let's use all the different p tools that we can. Let's bring them all together. And we had 400,000 people. And I was like, let me do one for three hours, but I'm not really capable of that. So I was like, <laughs> well, we'll do two days, we'll do two days for 90 minutes. And then I made it five days. Yeah. And the reason I do that is not because I like to talk. It's because you need a certain amount of immersion. It's like mm -hmm. learning a language. If you only learn a little bit at a time, you don't remember it two years later. But if mm -hmm. I put you in Rome, day and night for a month, you're gonna come out speaking Italian. Mm. So that's my theory. So what I did was I did five days, we had 400,000 people join us. And every day we took a part of their, their body, their emotions, their relationships. And the goal is get them a new perspective because it's hard to do that when you're at home, but not when you're in this audience literally of almost half a million people. But last year we did it again. We had 860,000 people that joined me for five days. So I'm doing one final one because I'm praying this is the last of COVID. Yeah. But I really want to help people here at the beginning of the year because you see so many people now are caught up in what I call learned helplessness. When you've been disappointed, oh, you get a gut check. But most people pick themselves back up. Mm. But if you get disappointed enough times, there's a point when your brain goes, the problem's permanent. Mm. It's just, or it's pervasive because I can't turn my business around. My whole life is over, which is not true. Mm. Or it's personal. There's something wrong with me. Mm. And so I want to break those patterns and give people a direct experience. So if you want to join me, guys, there's zero cost and you don't have to travel. So it kind of handles the so two great. objections yeah. most people have. And it's, as you said, it's coming up on January 25th through the 29th. Five days in a row, about 90 minutes each day. It's probably going to be more like two hours. <laughs> It'll be more. Me. But it's totally interactive. It's not you just sitting passively, and we're going to cover your body, your emotions, your relationship, your life, and get you to have a plan for 2022 here where you really can start to have a compelling future. And again, no cost to it. You can just go to, what is it, breakthrough2022.com. Okay. Because it's really the breakthrough challenge. I want you to break through your changes in your relationship, your business, your finance, your life. So breakthrough2022.com, and there's no cost. Go guys, I, I, you got to take advantage of something like this. I'm so excited for that. And I want to, I want to ask you hard stuff, like stuff maybe you don't get asked all the time, stuff that I get cool. asked that I struggle cool. with sometimes. And so I get, you know, obviously that they have their compelling future, got to change their physiology and their state. I believe the more I've been, you know, working with people the last 30 years, you know, it, winning is as much happiness, success sometimes to me is as much environmental as it is mental. And I get asked often, and I know you probably do too. Hey, I'm, I'm in a relationship where I live with someone who's not as driven as I am. Yeah. Uh, doesn't share my ambition. Might even be antagonistic towards some of my visionary thinking. Or even I come back from an event where I'm transformed, but they weren't in that same environment. So I'm in an environment or I work somewhere where it's negative. Do you have any yeah. advice for someone in transcending a not supportive or negative environment? Oh, the first thing is what you and I have already said. So I don't want to, I'm not want to be repetitive, but I got to be repetitive. You've yeah. got to be in the strongest physical state or your mind's not going to work there. Okay. And then secondly, you've got to feed that mind. Those two mm. things are prerequisite because it doesn't matter what the external environment is. If the internal environment is re-engineered, I mean, think of it this way. You can try and take a general car and try and do a Sahara Desert run or, you know, one of these crazy races that we could go for seven days, right? You're, mm. you're, gonna, you're gonna die, you're gonna be crushed in the first, you know, two hours. Mm. But they've engineered those cars, yeah. so that those trucks, so they can take the hit, so they can go through the desert, so they can go through the rain, so they can make all those things. We are in the middle of winter and we need to re-engineer ourselves. Mm. We can't mm. just sit around and say, I can't wait till it gets better. It doesn't work that way. Mm. You gotta re-engineer you so that winter is your season, so that you're not mm. freezing to death, you're learning to snowboard or ski or build this new version of your business or be with your family. I mean, literally there is an advantage and I know it sounds unbelievably overly optimistic, positive thinking, but you know me well enough, that's not where I come from. It's just yep. smart. Mm -hmm. Intelligence shows everything will provide an opportunity. You know, I have a, a nine-year-old daughter as a result of COVID because we tried for years. Yes. I was like, I've never been home this long. I said, okay, if I can be home and serve 10 times many people, which I've been doing, I've, you know, I've had seminars that used to be 10, 15,000 people at a stadium, and now I've got seminars of 800,000 people, right? It's like, right. 
I can reach more people, come home to my daughter, be with my wife. But there was advantages. There was, you know, I lost a hundred million dollars in the first six months of this area. And I, you know, I could handle the business thing, but it's like in my mission, screw the economics. How do I turn this around? But then you find a way to turn around, find a way to serve people. Now I get to see whole families because they, a lot of my seminars people do now digitally. Yeah. Not just this free one, but my regular ones. I built this giant stadium and now I can see in their living room. I see them with their kids who they didn't want to leave before to go or their husband who walks by going, what is this? And within a day, he's like, this is incredible, you know? Mm -hmm. So there's, there's an opportunity that has to be found, but you got to build your first base within you so that it isn't the environment. Now, does the environment play a role? Of course, if you're a great sprinter and you try to run in mud, you're not going to maximize your capacity. Mm -hmm. And that's why it's critical to choose, have a chosen family, so to speak. Mm -hmm. You know, I have my family who I adore Dirty. and love. Yeah. And I even, I have a friend I talked to the other day that I've known, gosh, since my first son was born. So, you know, 40 years, right? Mm -hmm. A little less than 40. And he's a good guy and he's, he's doing better now. But years and years ago, he was always just not growing. Everybody around him complained about him. He was taking advantage of my name. He's doing the crazy stuff. So I stayed friends with him, but I literally at one point said, I'm going to be a friend forever. But I said, we're not going to hang. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> something shifts. And it was one of the toughest things I ever did, but it was a really smart thing. And now, you know, 40 years later, he's made a shift. We have a nice relationship. He's grown. Yeah. But you got to choose who you're going to surround yourself with. Now, you can't do that sometimes, family or whatever the case may be, your husband or wife is in a line. Then you got to find how to get that alignment. And that's your job. Your job in a relationship is not to go get something. Your job in a relationship is to bring something to the table, which means you got to know what do they want, what do they need, what do they desire, what are their wounds. I mean, relationships, the easy thing in the world. They got to decide, what do I really want in detail? And then mm -hmm. you got to decide, what does this person really want, need, mm -hmm. desire? And then I got to get addicted to meeting those needs because if I meet their needs and I love doing it, mm -hmm. like in the beginning of a relationship, most people get so excited to light up their partner. After a few years, it's like, you know, would you take out the trash? You know what? <laughs> you know, they, lose, they lose the joy, they lose the passion. Right. So it's a long answer to you to say, I don't believe environment is the most important thing. Mm -hmm. In fact, I know it's not. Mm -hmm. The inner environment is the most important thing. I could take you person after person in the worst environment who found a way to thrive still. And so if, if you buy it's the environment, you're gonna, you're gonna end up being a victim even though that's not your mentality. It's just where it goes. Now, can I enhance my environment? Can I choose people to, to bring into my environment? People I wanna learn from, I wanna get coached by, people I wanna help? Yes, and that's critical for your long-term success. I just, uh, I just think about so many things that you do, not just that you say. And there's a lesson in there that most people would miss, but because we were talking a little bit when it happened, COVID happens and you, you've run a business a particular way. I'm talking about you. I mean, you've got other businesses, but sure, the one that you're most, you've got yeah. lots of them, right? But the one you're most well known for in the public yeah. is your, your outreach, the date with destinies, the life masteries, these yes. the UPWs, these events. And it was very expensive. You get this gigantic team. You can't put events on. They're not happening. But yet you then took a risk. You, you, you made a calculated risk by building a studio and making an investment where you had no idea where the people, it was like you built it and hopefully they would come, right? Yeah. And so and that was a real ballsy move, gutsy move at that time that no one else was making other than you in the space. Everyone was a little bit frozen and you did, you stepped forward and led. And I admired that so much. And I think right now, there's a lot of people that are sort of, they're holding back a little bit. They're a little bit, you know, gun shy right now. And I'm wondering if you think that's appropriate right now or what advice you give to somebody who says, you know, I'm just going to wait this out to see where the cards fall. Yeah, that, that would certainly not be my recommendation or I doubt yours. Ed, right. One, right. <laughs> because momentum is everything, right? Mm -hmm. The hardest part in life is creating momentum. So when that all happened, you know, I had built something of momentum over, you know, 40 years, literally at that point. Yeah around the world and you know what do you do all of a sudden when you know suddenly they say you can't do an event with more than 10 people and you've got 15,000 people scheduled to take over the stadium <laughs> and you know you know what i did i went we're going to vegas they're never going to shut down vegas right <laughs> but then they shut down vegas i was like i know i'm going to rent a church a mega church from a buddy of mine in houston mm -hmm. 15,000 people they're not going to keep costco open and shut down the church they kept costco open and shut down the church mm -hmm. so i got to the point where it's like what do you do and when you think there's nothing you can do that's when you can do something when you think I don't know what to do that's when you know what to do if you just push yourself mm -hmm. and so I was like I pulled my team together I saw a guy do like a webinar with two 52 inch screens and I said I'll kill myself first I said I got to create an experience for people they need it desperately wherever they are in the world 
So mm -hmm. literally I pulled out a tape recorder is like, okay, here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna do 20 foot high LED screens, 50 feet wide, <laughs> highest resolution in the world, 0.67, 150, you know, 50 degree, 180 degrees around me and around the back. I'm gonna call my buddy, Eric Yawn, and I'm gonna see if Zoom, we can expand him from the little thousand to 20,000 or 30,000. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna hire a firm to create an app so they can shake it so it sends a signal and you can hear reality of people clapping because the more shake it, the louder it gets. And I, I just started creating the whole thing in an hour there. So when I was done, my, my CFO says, uh, Tony, um, you know, after you saw all the numbers, yeah. it was over 20 million bucks by the time we're done. He's like, Tony, uh, should we rent some of this first? <laughs> and I said to him, I said, listen, of all, first of all, you can't. I said, go do your best. Not what I'm looking for. I said, second of all, this is going to be this way for a while. Yeah. And we're going to use this to help more people. And that, we don't, you know, when things go back to normal, we get to go do that too. Mm. And I just did a date with Destiny where I had, you know, uh, 10,000 people from 97 countries. And then I had 500 people in front of me because I built the studio so that there's 40 foot high ceilings. So I could literally lift the 20 foot screen. And so now I have a hybrid event. People don't want to come personally on there. People that want to be in the middle of the night in some other country are able to participate. Mm. But all that comes from just taking action and momentum. Yeah. If you build momentum, you can accomplish anything. You've seen it in sports. You see a team mm. that's dominating and then somebody steals the ball and the momentum changes. Yeah. Your job right now is to create momentum. And, that, and that's why I'm building this challenge is basically to say to you, let's do a breakthrough for you right now so you know it's real. Let's get you to get a real result. Let's get you to shift yourself physically and mentally and emotionally so you can build that momentum because it takes so much energy to rock it out of the atmosphere. It takes very little to take it out of the solar system. So that momentum, I think, is critical. Yeah. Do you think we're going back, Tony, to normal? You going back to normal ever? Or do you believe we're going to be in some sort of hybrid economy going? Did this just accelerate what was inevitable by a decade because of the pandemic and we were heading here anyway? I'm really curious as to your, you know, you talk to the best minds in the world, including your own. Where are, do you think we're going in terms of the economy? Well, I think I think there's uh, there are major challenges ahead. We're in winter mm -hmm. right now, but we have not seen our more challenging winter. And I don't say that out of being derogatory. Anybody could be right by being negative, right? Mm -hmm. But, you know, every year I fully prepare for a financial program I do where I bring in six or seven billionaires and I bring mm -hmm. experts in the field like a Michael Saylor on crypto, I bring in Ray Dalio on finance. I mean, literally, um, the who's who of the financial world is who mm -hmm. I get. And then I interview them seven days and nights. Well, to prepare for that, I have to see where things are going. So, you know, this is a book, by the way, if you don't already have, you should get Ray Dalio's newest book. It's called The Changing World Order. And mm -hmm. it kind of answers your question by studying mm -hmm. 500 years of history and showing you where we are. I mean, right now, we have some major challenges ahead. I think in the short term, we're going to do fine. We're going to make nice moves, I'm sure. We'll figure things out. But over the long term, we have to be prepared because there's a cycle change that's happening. And you need to understand these types of things. Um, mm -hmm. I'd recommend a book to anybody who's uncertain about their life right now to give it perspective. There's a book called The Fourth Turning. I read it in 1997. Still one of my favorite books in terms of importance. Not favorite to read, I'll be honest with you, the writing. Mm -hmm. But the insights and what it basically shows, uh, you know, uh, Bill Clinton gave me a book called Generations written by the same authors, William mm -hmm. Strauss and Neil Howe. Okay. And it's like 700 pages and it's 500 years of American history, you know, Anglo-American history. And mm -hmm. it shows up these patterns that we go through in history. They're mm -hmm. just like seasons. There's a winter, there's a spring, there's a summer, there's a fall. And they're documentable. He did a thousand years of Roman history and shared it. So this book on the fourth turning helped me understand that you got to know what season you're in. Because think about this, Ed. Like, if you and I want to make a difference for somebody, or our children, our grandchildren, there's three skills you got to master. If you're going to be in a world where right now, depending on who's you read Oxford studies, they say you know by 2040, which is you're going to blink your eyes and you're there. That's you know 19, 18 years. Yeah, you're going to see 45 percent of all current jobs will be gone. Yeah. Right? They're going to be replaced by robotics. They're going to be replaced by algorithms. They're going to be replaced by artificial intelligence. Yeah. So how do I take my nine-month-old daughter or my grandchildren and prepare them? Three skills will make you successful no matter how long you live, no matter what changes in society. Skill number one, yeah. it's the ability to recognize patterns. You're really good at it. You do it in finance. You do it in business. Thank you. I'm not just blowing your smoke. Thank That's you. why you're successful. Thank because you. when you recognize patterns, it allows you to go to the second step, which is use them. If you recognize financial patterns, you can do great things. You recognize patterns in business, you can turn around any business. You know, that's what I've been doing. For, that's, I have 105 companies now. We do $7 billion in business. And I have no business background. But I recognize the patterns. And I studied the billionaires that started with nothing and said, what did they do? How did they do it? How did they turn it around?
Hmm. So if you can recognize patterns and if you can use them, you got a great advantage. But then gradually over time, like, you know, if you go to play the piano, you usually play other people's music initially. Hmm. And then there's a point where you come through. Now you start creating patterns. And when you start creating patterns, that's when you become hmm. a dominant force in business and life and the marketplace and with your children or anywhere else. And so for me, those are the three most important kind of skill sets that anybody's going to have to have. Wow. And for me, I'm looking around saying, okay, how do I help my friends see the patterns that are coming financially? How do I help see the patterns that are coming physiologically? You know, there's new breakthroughs happening right now in health that are going to just blow your mind because everything that's become digitized all of a sudden has this growth of doubling in you know, capacity and having in cost. We all know what's happened over decades. Well, that's happening to our health now. We're made up of DNA. We're made up of code. And I just spent three years writing this book <laughs> called Life Force. I'm really proud of it. It's, it's not out yet. Come see, you can pre-order it. Go pre-order it. Yep. But what I can tell you is it's all regenerative medicine. It's things like, I'll give you a simplistic example. A fireman falls into the fire, he burns his face off. Traditionally, up until two years ago, the way in which they help him to try to heal and his face will be disfigured is they put cadavers on there. That's how cadaver skin is how they've done it. Most people don't know that. It's horrific, it scars you. Now they have a spray gun at seven hospitals here in the United States. They can take your stem cells and spray your stem cells on. Oh and I've got a book, you should see the pictures, like seven days later, it looks like this person wasn't burnt. Oh my God. But it's mind boggling. Wow. You know, uh, uh, Christian Ronaldo, or, or a better example would be um, Jack Nicholas. Jack Nicholas was in so much pain, he couldn't stand for 10 minutes at a time. Now he's playing golf again. Yeah. Right, with just some of these simple tools that are available. And there's things happen right now, and there are things that are coming over the next 24 to 36 months. So you want to know what the patterns are so you can play, so yeah. you can make the most out of your life, so you can deal with the challenges quickly, and you can find the way to succeed at the highest level. But if you're going to be, if you're going to have an extraordinary life, you have to remember losers react, yeah. winners anticipate, leaders anticipate. Your yeah. job is to anticipate. So how do you anticipate? You read, you listen to podcasts, you mm. find people who are the best in the world and figure out what they have to say. Not everybody's got an opinion, mm. but you know, if I talk to Ray Dalio, he's the most successful <laughs> you know, hedge fund guy in history, he's brought more money back than anybody in history. And he's done it in good times and in bad since the 1970s. Good guy to talk to, you know, he's got some decent insight, right? <laughs> right? So I'm fortunate enough to have those people be my friends because what I did, I went and wrote those financial books and how they do it? I said, let me interview the 50 smartest financial people in the world that started with nothing. Yeah. What do they have in common? How do they go about it? And then I made those distinctions. And then I teach them to people. Yeah. I'm doing that now with regenerative medicine for health and vitality and energy as well. I cannot wait for that because you know it's like my jam right now. It's the I know it is. <laughs> and, the, and the third thing that you said there is one of my favorite things of all the things you said prior since I've known you is that third step of creating patterns, man. Like that's everyone that I should go back and replay that again. If you have children, like go hear that again, because I was thinking about patterns. And I was thinking about you've studied these, you know, these financially successful top 50 of all time. Then you've done it in the regenerative, you're doing it in the medicine world, the preventive and regenerative medicine, the future of anti-aging, all that space. But the other thing that you've had a front row seat to is helping people achieve success, but more importantly, fulfillment. There's these things that always run through my mind that are like your isms, you know, success without fulfillment is the ultimate failure quality right, of your right. life the quality of your life is the quality of your emotions and yeah. i repeat these things and then i teach these things and i have my spin on them yes. but you know i'm wondering the commonality of the fulfilled people is there something that they have in common if you took the group of the fulfilled ones yeah patterns behaviors something about them that if i wanted fulfillment in my life that you see they all have in common yes um they you, you got to separate two skills out. I think most people okay. in life think success is getting what you want and fulfillment is living what you're made for, you know? Mm. And so getting what you want is not that complex, mm. right? The, the human brain, you can train your brain to become this servo mechanism that'll go figure out how to solve something. A lot of people have had a goal or desire where they got so obsessed, they couldn't stop thinking about it. And they didn't even have a plan and they met somebody and then something else happened and it came together. Right now, if they also had consciousness and effort and discipline, and it's a heck of a lot easier to achieve those things. But mm -hmm. frankly, with enough focus and enough massive action and enough consistency and modeling what already works, you can pretty much achieve anything. 
Mm -hmm. Um, You know, because when it comes to science, we're talking about the science of achievement. Your body's a science. You might be biochemically slightly different, but there's certain rules that if you violate them, you're going to have problems and pain. If you align with them, you have high energy. Money is the same way. The fulfillment's different. Mm -hmm. Because what fulfills people is completely different. It's like, if you want to know what the universe or God loves, go to a forest. What do you see? Everything's different. Every leaf, every little snowflake, there's similarities but there's all these differences. And so people have got to find what makes them really fulfilled. But I can give you, there's not laws like there are for success, Mm -hmm. but there are principles. And the two principles I can tell you to answer your question, who's most fulfilled, it's people that are growing and people that are giving. Mm -hmm. We are made to grow. If we don't grow, it doesn't matter how much money you made, doesn't how many people gave you Academy Awards, stars on your chart. I mean, I get the phone calls from all these people Mm -hmm. who you would think have the greatest life in the world and then they're calling me because it's not so great Mm -hmm. because they haven't mastered the inner world. They're good at the outer world. Mm -hmm. But this one, this one hasn't been given enough time or energy. They've been so focused out here and they've done so well out here. Not so well in here. This is the one you want to do well on. Mm. You do well here, you can master the outside world too. You can handle anything. Mm. So for me, it really comes down to looking at it and saying, okay, if you and I are going to have an extraordinary level of fulfillment, what's going to make me grow? Because that's what's going to make me proud. And to grow, you got to face challenges. And I think the biggest problem most people have is the biggest problem they have is they think they shouldn't have problems. <laughs> you know, yes. It's like yes. problems are a sign of life. <laughs> right. Problems are what make you grow. Now, you know, I'd, I'd rather call it a challenge. I'd rather look at it as a challenge and take it on as a challenge. But you and I both know. Yeah. I mean, I have grown so much in the last 24 months, t- taking 105 companies, some of which were literally shut down for, you know, 12 months, keeping them alive, not letting go of my employees, figure a way to turn around, figure out how to adapt. I mean, I've developed more skill and ability to help other people because mm-hmm. I had to manage my own state, unbelievably so. Mm-hmm. I had to help other people manage their state. So without the challenge, would I grow so much? Probably not. And then out of growing, you have something to give. And you know, you think about it, Ed, and I know you're this way, but I think we're all this way. If you have an experience of something that's really amazing, something you love, what's the first thing you want to do? Share it. If it's, share it with somebody you care about, right? Why? Because if you just have it in yourself, you only feel so much, but sharing it magnifies it. Mm-hmm. So the people I see that they're, they're just growing and giving, but they also are really good at this pattern recognition. So let me give you one more note about pattern recognition, because I, I want to complete the thought for your listeners and viewers. Think of it this way. There's power when you recognize a pattern and you can use it. There's even greater power sometimes when you can create a pattern. So think of it from the standpoint of humanity. For thousands of years, we were wandering through the environment, trying to survive, moving from place to place, being, you know, gatherers and hunters of that nature. And then when did humanity change? We made one pattern recognition, Mm. seasons. Mm. See, when we understood seasons for the first time, we understood if you plant in the winter, it doesn't matter how hard you try, you're going to get nothing. Yeah. You have to plant in the spring. Wow. You got to push through the hot summer and then wow. you get to have the fall where you reap. And then guess what? The winter's coming again. again. And some winters are long, some are short, you know, some happen sooner, some later, but you can't break the sequence. Mm. And so there's a pattern that pattern changed humanity. So I'll tell you the pattern will wow. change anybody else wow. realizing there's a pattern to your own life. Yeah. There's a pattern zero to 20 is for most people springtime it's where it's the easiest to grow you're being taken care of if you're lucky some of us maybe not and some of us have to take care of others at a young age but regardless overall 019 2021 you get to gather and learn information and be taken in to some extent depending upon your life then what happens 21 to 41 you go test that and decide what you believe Mm. Like they told me how to be this way. Screw that. I'm going to try this. You know, yeah. you go to college, you go try something, you start a business, you get in relationship and you have all this testing procedure. And so now you go through the hot summer of figuring it all out. Yeah. And then if you've really done a good job planting in the spring and building through that summer, you'll hit the autumn where you get to reap. Yeah. Where if you've done really well, 41 to 61 is a reaping time. Mm. Right. If now, if you didn't plant in the spring, you know, Jim Rohn used to talk about you'll be weeping in the fall if you don't do it right. 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 So if you don't do your job, you're going to have problems. Mm. But that pattern is in people's lives. And then 61 to 81. And if you're lucky, 81 to 102. That's the extended next season of winter. But winter could be the best mm. season of your life. You have a great time with your family. You're close. You're mentoring people. You have a different experience. You have plenty of business. You can do whatever you want to do or not want to do. Mm. So those are seasons. But then there's one more pattern. Okay. And this is the one I hope I'll reach your listeners or viewers with. There's a pattern of history. Mm. You know, it's often been said, history doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes. 
Okay. You know, yeah. any lesson we don't learn from history tends to repeat itself because as the older people die who know how bad history, like let's say the World War II generation, mm -hmm. then the lessons are lost. Mm -hmm. So think about this just for a second. Imagine for a second, you want to understand how generations are built. Here's my simple math for it. So imagine this for your viewership right now. Awesome. And think, of it, think of it yourself. Imagine you're born in 1910. Mm -hmm. So you're going to come of age. 1920, 21, and 1929. Now, you're gonna have a very different experience because what happened? World War War ended, it looked really good, and then the roaring 20s happened while you're 10, 12, 14 years old. People are getting cars and radios, and people are dead. This is the greatest time of my life. And right when you come to that stage, you thought you're gonna get a car. Red line. Jumping out of buildings, the economy's going through the floor, we got the Dust Bowl. I mean, that generation, wow. From 21 to 41, what happened uh, when they turned 29? Well, think of it, they were born in 1910, that means 1939. So they made it through the depression, that generation, to go to a war that most people don't even know what is it about. It was a war that if you were alive at that time, it looked like Hitler was gonna win. Like he was taking over the entire world, yep. right? The Nazis, it looked like we were gonna lose. It did not look good. So all of a sudden, this generation goes to fight this war for survival, and yeah. guess what? They come back in 1945, and they win. And now think about it. They were born in 1910, right? So here they are, 35 years old, mm -hmm. and they come back to being a hero, mm -hmm. Veterans Administration, suburbia. They can have a home. Mm -hmm. They can finance it. And these heroes came back, and they took care of our – they were the next springtime. Mm -hmm. Think of what it was like. Gosh. And, uh, 30s and 40s versus the 50s and 60s mm. say the 50s to early 63 before kennedy was killed mm. it was a high time for a lot of people now not if you're african-american right. not if you're a woman in some cases i was so just it's thinking not universal, that yeah. yeah but just give you a historic component but think about what happened after kennedy was killed and then robert kennedy and then martin luther king the 60s a completely different generational race if you were born at that time you have a different perspective on life. If you came of age in the 60s, you have a different mm. perspective than someone who came of age in 1929. Mm. You're going to look at life differently, you're going to respond differently. And then what happens in the 80s to the 2000s, where with this fall, where you could give anybody anything and they give you a house, right? Where the stock market <laughs> goes up no matter what. But then you get past early 2000s, 2008, and now where have we been since 2008? We're in winter, mm. right? And the good news about winter is in the beginning, it separates people. In the end, when there's a real pressure, like I remember talking to the President Clinton one time and I'm, I was 32 years old, and I'm walking with him at Camp David and it's snowing and this little, this little deer went by and it was like a surreal moment. He's telling me all these things and all these challenges. And I'm thinking, this guy is the President of the United States and he's stressed out, this concerns me, you know? <laughs> right. I'm coaching this guy, right? But I remember looking at the time thinking, these are such easy problems. Hmm compared to an earlier generation. So here's why I tell you that. The generation that we call the great generation that fought World War II, that made it through the depression, that came back and turned things around, that generation was not respected in the beginning. They were seen as flappers early on. They're seen mm. as weak. They responded because the environment got tough. That's why my response to you about the environment doesn't matter. The environment, the most challenging environment is the best environment if you don't give up. Mm. Because it'll bring out things inside of you that nothing else will. And that generation went on. So I think right now you see a constellation of generations. Yeah. You got the Z generation, right? You've got, you know, you got them arguing about the part in their hair right. between them and the millennials. Yeah. But at the same time, these are people that are tech savvy. Yes. They're being prepared to be the next heroes. I think the next group of heroes is this constellation of generations. And we're not facing it right now because we're running off on the corner. Imagine if you were an American you know, one of the pilgrims coming over, a one in three to one in two chance you wouldn't last a year. Mm. They give up their life for freedom. Mm. And we're sitting around going, you know, how many more masks should I put on? And how many more <laughs> shots can I get? And, and who can I avoid even getting near? Mm. I mean, it's, it's embarrassing, mm. but I think it has its limits. And I think there are a lot of people hitting their threshold right now and saying, you know what, I'm tired of living in fear and I'm gonna take my life back. I don't know how yet, but I'm gonna find the people who got those answers. I'm gonna get the answers and I'll make it happen. And so I'm one of those people, you're one of those people, there's lots more. But I think people have to decide to put the plant their feet and say no more. That's one of the best things I've heard. I Also just an explanation and definition of actually why to be optimistic. Actually, yeah. why to be optimistic. 
And I, it's, I, I need re I think people sometimes need reasons to be optimistic. And I do, I only, I think about this young generation, the Z Y generation one, I think they've been exposed to different things. They want to contribute. They want to be a part of causes and missions. They're not yes. just all financially driven. So many of them want to be a part of something that makes a difference in the world. And we got to unleash them. It's about time we stop sitting on our hands and not unleash them the way you described it. You are now trickling into the winter stage at yes. your age. Yes. And I'm curious if there's something, this is like what was a friend, but we'll let people listen in. Um, <laughs> maybe you used to really believe firmly about life, people that you no longer believe. I think the smartest people mm. every once in a while go, you know, I changed my mind. I think yeah. I, I go, I, I'm always kind of concerned about someone who never changes their mind. You've got yeah. more information, more experience, and you think the exact same things you thought 25 years ago, that would concern me. So yeah. I'm curious in your case, if there's something profoundly that you, you, know, you kind of were pretty sure you knew that you've shifted your beliefs on, or maybe more than uh, one. I was gonna say, <laughs> there's probably a lot more than one. Yeah. Just trying to think of more, in a more current form. I think there was a point in my life where I thought that I had to, I think my model of the world was sacrifice. And then, you know, about, 15 years ago, I remember I was on my home in Fiji and I was looking up at all these crosses and I was so frustrated. It's like, wow, I'm doing this to me. I'm the one that's making it you know, either or. I'm the one that's saying I have to give up everything that matters in order to serve in a certain way. I had had these stories in my head. I'll tell you another small one, but it's a big one, small, mm -hmm. simplistic, but big. I remember telling my wife, I will not have a child after 50. I mean, I've already got... <laughs> Four kids, I got five grandkids. I'm not doing after 50 because I'm not showing up at my kids' high school graduation at 70. And now I'm gonna be there at, at, <laughs> at 81. <laughs> awesome, congratulations. <laughs> but that's also why I'm so glad I studied all the things I have. Now I gotta live a lot longer. You do, you get more so I got reason. the tools to do it. Yeah, that's so wonderful, brother. Is there, uh, I got a couple more things because I, sure. I get you here. Hard things to ask. Like, I don't wanna ask you the things you always get asked. So. I get asked things, and these are the ones that I have str struggled with. It's not, is it okay to quit? Meaning, is there a point where, and, and, and how do you know if I'm on a path that's just not working? I'm in a business that's just not working, or I'm in a relationship that's just not working. I think there's, we've yeah. created this culture that quitting is this horrible thing. If you ever yes. quit, that's failing. Yes. And I think some people create this bondage around them almost in a relationship yeah. or in, in a business environment where pivoting even is like, you know, something, a terrible thing to do. I'm just curious what you would, what you would say about that. That's a great quality question. I, it reminds me of one more thing that's changed within me because, you know, I stayed in a relationship for 20 years where I was really not happy. Mm -hmm. I made everybody else happy, which was my mm -hmm. whole sacrifice thing. Sacrifice thing. And, um, and the reason I did it was because I grew up with four fathers, right? I swore I'd never get a divorce. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you, you build these ideals I remember there's certain things like I'd rather die than that. Oh, what a stupid ass thing to say. But we develop these beliefs that once they become an ideal, they kind of have, they possess you and they take you over. So you got to be able to question anything. And so the answer to your question is, yes, there's a time to move on. There's a time to start something new. There's a time to learn the lesson that this business or this relationship or this experience has given you and make a move. Because otherwise the real test is, are you growing? Like if you're in a relationship, you know it's a great relationship if you're constantly wanting to be better for the person you love. Mm. If you don't really give a shit what they think, that's not a good sign, right? Right. I mean, it just means there, there's not the level of, in, of intimacy. There's not the level of connection. You might have been together forever, but it's not where it needs to be. So it's like the, telling yourself the truth, I think is the hardest thing for people. Mm. And I think the ideals get in the way of that truth, meaning the things you've you know, and, and grandized in your mind to be absolute. But I think when it comes to a business, it's not an easy question when it comes to an investment. I don't, I, in investments, it's easy. I don't move to a new investment until I found a better one. Mm. I don't just get pulled by the next shiny thing. I really look and make sure it's there. When mm. it comes to businesses, I'm pretty crazy. I've stayed in businesses way too long. Me too. I should have probably gotten out, but I did it and then sold it and made a little mm. money. But it was just, it was my whole thing that I don't quit. So, but I think there are times when you have to adapt the business to something new. Mm -hmm. I mean, if I was still doing what I was doing two years ago, you know, on the road doing what I was doing, I mean, I would do 115 cities on average, um, usually 12 to 16 countries. I was on a train, a plane, a helicopter every two to three days. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I don't even, I, and no one would have ever stopped me because they couldn't because there's mm -hmm. so much momentum of what I'm yes. doing. 
But if I was doing that right now, you know, my 250 employees at that company would be all unemployed, you yeah. know, because all around the world, they made it illegal to do what I was doing. So yeah. you have to be able to tell yourself the truth about where you are. And also, though, not give up too easily by saying, where's the season of this business? Okay. Where's the development? Like if a business is really young, it's a toddler business, mm -hmm. it's going to burn more cash than it's yes. going to give you back. Yeah. If it's a, you know, if it's a business that's in that go-go phase, that teenage phase, you get overconfident, grows like crazy, and then you don't have the profits at some point when the sales slow down and you got real trouble. Is it a business that's aging? But also I got to look at what's the industry. Like I'll give an example. I have a friend, really good guy, maybe 44, 45 years old, prime of his life. Like you had really well put together. I mean, takes care of his body, great mm -hmm. mind, great mindset without giving his personal life away, he owns a, a very large business in Australia, do dominates an industry. And the industry relates to big box office supplies. Okay. So I had him at one of my business seminars and I'm walking him through these stages, just like a human being goes through life stages. So does a business, mm -hmm. just like history, right? Yes. And if you know what stage you're in, you know, you can do the right thing at the wrong time and you don't get rewarded. Yes. Plant in the winter, you don't get rewarded, right? Buy a house, sounds good. 2007, mm, maybe not the best time, right? You know? I so it's like, you got to take a look at where these things fit. Where, where is the where is the real decision-making here that makes this happen? So anyway, he's got this office supply business and he's young and dynamic. So in his life cycle, he's in his prime. Yeah. His business is in its prime. He's worked for years, it's crushing it. But where's the industry? Is that a young business, a growing business? Yeah an aging business. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's no question it's an aging business. And I said to him, I said, you got to separate these out because if you're using your brain intelligently, you got to sell this business because even though you got a great business, the multiple is going to go down every year because the industry is going down. Yes. You take those resources and reinvest. So again, it's looking at things by telling yourself the truth, seeing what stage they're in and seeing what stage the world's in. Because mm -hmm. you might have the best idea in the world, but it's not going to work when everybody's shut in their homes, perhaps, yep. depending upon what the product or service is. So you yep. have to adapt. I love it. You, uh, to get clarity, you had taught me a long time ago, you know, about my rituals and habits and my routines. And I'm curious if there's anything new you're doing or what your morning routine just looks like for you. Is there anything new to it? And give, take them through maybe just the, 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 the big pillars of it. Yeah, the basic fundamentals is I get up in the morning. The first thing I do is I go in this freezing cold water and I do it as a discipline, not only for the health of my body, because it moves everything in your body, it moves your limp throughout your whole system. But it's also kind of been my mental discipline for about seven or eight years. It's like, I don't negotiate. There's never been a day where I wake up and go, I can't wait to jump in this freezing water it's 55 right. degrees right but i just i don't say oh in a moment or let me think about it or let me do it later it's like now mm -hmm. when i say go we go and i've trained my brain to do yeah. that while i also give it a, a great physical benefit and then i do what i call priming which two minute version of is it's just 10 minutes now sometimes i do longer because it feels good mm -hmm. but i do it for 10 minutes because if i said do this for 20 or 30 people don't have time but if you don't have 10 minutes for yourself you don't have a life so I do three things really fast. I change my body. And I, if, if people go to uh, Tony Robbins forward slash priming, there's a free video there. It'll show you how to do it. Awesome. But the essence of it is you change your breathing to awaken your body. And mm -hmm. then I do three things. I spend three minutes where I focus on three things I'm truly grateful for, which sounds so basic. Mm -hmm. But I don't just think about it like seeing myself on a roller coaster over there. I imagine being in the front seat of the roller coaster going over the edge so that I feel it. Mm -hmm. And the reason you use gratitude and you stack it every day is that gratitude destroys the two emotions that wipe out most people's quality of life, fear and anger. Think about it, what messes up your relationship, what messes up your body, what messes up your business, fear Amen. and anger. So, so if you're in a situation where you're grateful, you can't be grateful and angry simultaneously, it's okay. gone. Yeah. And instead of being grateful for some phony thing, you're remembering a real moment and you're reliving it in your body. So it activates your nervous system, not just your mind. Mm. And that's a big difference. Mm. So I do three of those. And then I do three minutes of these types of health blessings, so to speak, for myself, and my family. And then I do three minutes on what I call three to thrive. I think of three things I want to achieve. And I don't wish for it, hope for it. I see it as done. I feel the celebration. I acknowledge, I give gratitude for it. And I own it. It sounds overly simplistic. But in 10 minutes, I'm primed, meaning my brain now is going to look and find the things I wanted to versus the old brain that we all have that's mm -hmm. looking for what's wrong. Mm -hmm. And so by doing that each day, it makes it really simple. And then the last thing I tend to do is I try to make one text or phone call 
or I leave an audio message for somebody yeah. to acknowledge somebody sincerely. Yeah. And I, I don't just go, oh, you did great, buddy, or you're really hot. I, you know, I say, you know, I saw you Tuesday mm -hmm. when we were with those kids. And I noticed you were the only one that stood afterwards and spent the time with them. And I just want to acknowledge you for that. And thank you for that type of thing. Mm -hmm. And then the last thing I do is I do the most difficult thing of the day. It's like, I always try to start with the most difficult thing because when you conquer that, everything else is easy. So if there's something I'm not looking forward to do or there's a meeting I don't want, that's the one I do. Don't you think that lastly, a difficult thing creates momentum too, don't you? Once you it really does. And yeah. also it makes you, once again, just like starting the morning with something difficult. It's like, change your brain. There isn't anything that difficult, right? Let's just go do this. Let's go handle it. It, it puts you in a state of action as opposed to a state of thinking. Okay, so good. All right, two, two minutes. I got two questions left. There are so many things in my life that, you've said to me as a friend and also just your work that's impacted me, but there's just this subtle thing you said one time. I'm going to, like you said earlier, I think the six, the success part, there's a science to, right? The fulfillment yeah. part is an art and you had had you had an experience where you just said, you know, I just, someone said, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but being in a beautiful state. Yeah. And I and then asked myself, I said, Ed, like what percentage of the time, I'm always ranking things, you know, what percentage <laughs> like of the time are you in a beautiful state? You know, and kind of as a masculine dude, you kind of like, it's a little bit weird, but, but how often am I just feeling in a beautiful state? And, it, and yeah. I didn't like the answer. It wasn't as much. What was as your it, answer back then? Well, honestly, I think I said to myself, it was about 1% of the time. Ooh. And, and this you know, is, you know, what's somebody... crazy is when you, when you hear beautiful state, some people think, like you said, it doesn't sound very masculine, but let me give two seconds of background. Yeah, please. And then just family. elaborate on it. Go ahead. Yeah. yeah. I mean, um, for most of my life, like help people achieve, accomplish mm -hmm. everything, achieve, make it happen. And if you ask me, I was fulfilled, I'd say, of course I was. And I was, I loved it, but f there's different levels of fulfillment, right? Mm -hmm. If you've never smelled a rose and someone's telling you what a rose is like, you think, you know, to experience it. Yeah. So I had this experience in India. I go about every two years mm -hmm. and there was a friend of mine there who's built this amazing facility and he had like a quarter million people showing up for his event. They expected they would have, you know, I think they had a hundred thousand people and a quarter million people showed up and then a million two by the next morning. Mm -hmm. And the guy that was there is a really smart guy. And so I had a conversation with his son and he was thanking me for all this work I've done. He goes, Tony, of all the things you've taught me, he said, I think maybe the most important thing is all the ways I can change my state. I can get unstuck. I can, I can get myself to follow through. He goes, it is priceless. And he really thanked me. And I said, well, I really appreciate it. And more importantly, I'm glad you're using it, right? Mm -hmm. He goes, but I just have one little thing I'd like to ask you. He goes, you know, you talk about if you're in a peak state, you get peak performance. Or if you're in an energy rich state, a high energy state, you're going to produce differently than a low energy state or a lousy state. And I said, yeah. And he goes, well, what if you call those high energy states beautiful states? I said, that's great, because it's not just happiness. A beautiful state could be excitement. It could be gratitude. It could be love. It could be kindness, it could be warmth. It could be, I mean, there's a million beautiful states. It's any high energy state where no one has to tell you what to do, you'll do the right thing. Mm. So he goes, okay. And I said, so yeah, beautiful state's great. And then he goes, what if we took all those lousy states, those low energy states, those, those types of states, and what we call those suffering. And Ed, when he said that, it probably kind of mm. like what you experienced, it yeah. like nod at me a little bit. It's like yeah. suffering. I don't like suffering. I don't suffer, mm. but I do have times when I'm frustrated or stressed or overwhelmed. So I couldn't deny it. So I was like, okay, yeah, those would be suffering states. Mm. I felt this little trap going on in me. And I yes. said, why do you say this? Yes. He goes, Tony, because I think it's the most important distinction you've made, but I like to use some other words around it. He goes, because I've set a spiritual vision for myself. Mm. I said, what's that? He said, my goal is to live in a beautiful state every day, no matter what. He goes, to me, that would be the most gorgeous life because, you know, people have everything and they're miserable. They're pissed mm. off. They're frustrated and so forth. He goes, you deal with them all the time. Mm. And I said, that is brilliant. But I change it slightly for me. I'd say life is too short to suffer. Oh, so to me, that's where it starts. Life's too short to suffer. How could I possibly suffer when I've been able to live this magnificent life? It's just the mind. If you don't direct this thing, it directs you. It's yeah. like you use the mind or it uses you. You use stress or stress uses you. Yeah. And so I said, you know, okay, so how am I going to do that? Because it's one thing to say it. Yeah. It's another to develop the habits. Yeah. Right? And when I, I found myself like getting on a plane and, you know, I have my own plane now, obviously, but mm. at the time I used to go to Australia four times a year and mm. I'd fly on Qantas. And when I moved to Florida, it became 20 hours each yeah. way, like a 40 hour trip yeah. for one little visit. Yeah. And I remember getting on the plane and being so stressed. And I thought to myself, Tony, how can you be stressed? You're flying in a plane, you can fall asleep, you can, you know, it's, it's not my size bed, obviously, but I'm in first class, I'm, I'm very lucky. Mm -hmm. It's like, come on, what are, you, what are you whining about in your head? And I realized what it was, was that 
they had no internet. So now I'm flying for 40 hours and what's happening? All my slacks, all my emails, all my texts, all, it's all growing. Fortunately, I got this resolved in my head before I got lucky, lucky enough to have my own plane. And I remember when I got worked out, I got on a plane, I flew from here to LA, I got on a plane in LA and the, you know, the captain comes on and goes, uh, this Captain Stubblebine, it's gonna be a beautiful flight to Sydney. And then he said something I never heard before. He said, today I have a special announcement and it's this. We have for the first time in the history of Qantas, international Why internet. <laughs> Literally people stood up on the plane and cheered and clapped. I wanna stand up too, but everybody see me, right? So I stayed there and clapped in my chair. So we all open up our iPads, our, our phones, our everything we got, right? We're all typing, doing our stuff and social media. And nine minutes later, what do you think happened? It breaks down, it crashes. And when do you think it turns on again? <laughs> when you never, <laughs> never. And the thing that struck me at, and it's changed my life, is I looked around me and people were angry. They were cursing, what the hell's wrong with this airline? They can't get this shit right, blah, 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 blah. And I looked around, I was like, this is amazing. Nine minutes ago, this was a miracle. Now it's already an expectation. Gosh. And then I realized mm. all the unhappiness comes from all those expectations. You can't help to have the mind expect, but you can direct it. And when you expect something is not met, you get upset. Yeah. And it's like, if, if the only time I'm happy is when everybody meets my expectations, I got 105 companies, I got 3,800 employees on four continents. What are the chances someone's screwing up right now, meaning doing something different than I think they should? God, 100%. Man. So it's like, I need to make it so that other people don't have to behave a certain way for me to be happy. Mm -hmm. I, I have my preferences of what I wish they'd do, sure. but I'm not going to live my life in reaction to whether things work out the way I expect or not. And so I said, I'm committed to it. So I have a 30 second rule, 90 second rule sometimes yeah. is like within 90 seconds, ideally 30, I catch myself feeling that stress and I let it go. And the way I let it go is I find something to be grateful for. Okay. Because you can't stay stressed if you're grateful. And there's always something you can appreciate or love or respect or be thankful for. And the minute you do that, it changes your biochemistry, your entire mm -hmm. biochemistry changes like a different person. Mm -hmm. And so now it's become a habit for me. So I wouldn't say that I'm never stressed or never sure. do that. But if mine was, you know, I, I probably was more liberal of myself, said I was in a beautiful state, maybe 20% of the time. Yeah. I would say it's more like 85% of the time now. It takes a lot to grab it because it just becomes a new habit. It's not that you're better, it's just you built muscle. Yes. Now the same stuff that used to upset you, you put in a different perspective. I, I freaking love it. And the one thing that you helped me do with that is I, I identify my pattern, like what put me into the state. And for me, it was a yes. little bit of the reverse. So I'll ask you one last question. Mine was more like, if I'm not meeting everybody else's expectations, yes. I need to suffer. And this standard of what I thought their expectations were was just something I made up in my mind. It was but something wired into me as a little boy. If I can meet my dad's expectations, if I can meet my mom, yeah. if I can meet my coaches, then I won't suffer. Then I'll allow myself to live in a beautiful state. And once I acknowledge that pattern, understood it, it lost its power over me, and I've created a new one. So thank you for that. And that was just awesome. So, I'm so glad to hear that. I gotta tell you, honestly, till I was 50, I still like on my birthday when I was 40, when I was 35, I haven't done it. If I have tens of millions of people, it was never <laughs> enough because I had that same thing you had. Yeah. And then I have to sacrifice to make that happen. But I can honestly say at this stage of my life, you know, it's like I wake up and I know I've accomplished plenty. Yes. I've helped millions of people. It doesn't make me any less hungry to want to help. Mm -hmm. But it's just I'm no longer, there's no longer a hole I'm, I'm trying to fulfill or fill up with this piece. It's more like, I, I just want to help. It's like, I used to have these giant mission statements. Oh, I'm going to transform this and that. And you know, I have huge goals and feed a billion people. I got some good stuff, but it's like, my whole thing is just, how can I help? Yeah. And to me, that makes life so much more enjoyable because when I help somebody, I feel phenomenal inside. And the fact that I've got something to help means I grew someplace to be able to do that in the first place. Well, you did it today here and thank you for this last hour. I mean, I, I know that I'm already, I can feel it. I can feel the people sharing this with people that they love and care about. So last question, you are a new dad again. Yeah. And I did introduce you as Jesus when we started. So I might as well ask you this question. <laughs> so clearly when, not <laughs> when she gets, and I, we both know that, but when, when she gets to of an age and this may be kind of corny, but I don't feel like it is. Cause I, I, I would love to know your answer to this I and mean, it'll probably change. But if she asked you, daddy, what is, what is life all about? What's yeah. the meaning of life? I mean, this is a man, everybody, who's just affected so many lives and met people from every single walk of life, from people that have had the most terrible things done to them in their life, to the most successful people, to world leaders, presidents of the United States, top athletes, entertainers. 
the best business minds in the world. And, and yet you walk amongst everybody at all of your events. And she asked you at some time when she really wants to know, Daddy, what is life all about? What's the purpose of this thing? What would you say? Yeah. It's about growing and giving. I mean, I know that's overly simplistic, but that's what I want for her. It's like, you know, it's about laughing, loving, growing, giving, mm -hmm. you know, and giving passionately and generously and graciously. It doesn't, I don't mean just money. I mean, mm -hmm. of your presence. Yeah. You know, it's very easy to say hello and not be there. It's very easy to say, I love you. And, you know, it's just a habit, you know, mm -hmm. about, you know, depending on which studies you read about 47 to 52% of things we do are just habit. And the cool thing about habit is it allows you to do other things like, you know, trying to drive a stick shift car in the beginning is way it's overwhelming. Now it's one thing I can do 20 other things, right. Mm -hmm. But the problem with it is technology has made us become more and more habitual and less and less connected. And so for my daughter, I want her to experience love. That's what life is to me. Mm -hmm. And when you are loving, you have to grow to keep loving. And you, when you're growing and you're loving, you're going to give. And to me, if that's all she does, if she learns that life is not what you're here to get, it's what you're here to give, that you're being called to find what you're called for. And I don't know what you'd be called for. She, you know, may, she might sing, she might draw art. She might just be a mom. She's not just one of the mm -hmm. most important things in life. She might, I don't know what she'll do. And I have no frame of reference about how she's going to do it. I have only one frame of reference. She's going to be a person that's earned it. And mm -hmm. she's going to be a person who's proud of herself because the earned part to me is where the pride comes. It's like, I have this amazing life. You could take away all the toys and things that I have. You couldn't change who I've become as a man. Yeah. And, and also because I never had those things and I earned those things, there's, there's the, the stories and the examples and you know what it's like, right? To yeah. conquer all the challenges to get there. I want my daughter to have all those experiences, but to yeah. me, life is love and life is growing and giving. It's really, that's what the whole game is about. As far as I'm concerned. What a beautiful answer. Thank you for today, brother. Thank you so much. I love you, Ed. You're a great man. I love you. Good luck. Continue to crank it here. I see your podcast is crushing it. Yeah. <laughs> and I hope to see you in person sometime soon. I know, man. We need to get together in person. And everybody, hey, January 25th event, we'll put the link to the event in the show notes. And you can pre-order Life Force right now, too, so that you're getting that book the minute that it comes out. So, Tony Robbins, thank you for being here today, brother. Everybody, thank you for being here. And please share the show with people that you love and care about. God bless you all. Max out. Hey guys, thanks for sticking around. If you'd like more, click the videos right here. They're exactly what you need to see next. And if you're new here, hit subscribe and become a part of the Max Out community. And tell me what you think about the videos in the comments below. I read all of them every week, and I select winners that get all kinds of prizes, gear, coaching calls with me. Make a comment.